You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday True Crime Edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. Today we take a look at one of the most popular modern non-athletic sports the launching of third parties, specifically the most successful third party in American modern history. But first, a little background. If you pay attention to politics, you've probably noticed that every year or two, another group launches another third party bid or third way outfit or country over party quote unquote movement. And over the years, as the Republican Party has gotten progressively more deranged, the number of people pushing a third party has accelerated. And over the decades spent tracking these hustles and fan dances, we've seen this trick over and over again, and we've learned a few things. Things like people who say, my my third party will eventually become the resting grift face of almost anyone who built a career out of being a professional both siderist and of a small group of enterprising Republicans who swear they woke up one day to discover, to their utter shock, that their Republican Party was full of Republicans. This is why so many disgruntled current and former Republican office holders have popped out of obscurity in the past four years to announce, with great solemnity, that they are forming their own boutique, third party, or movement, or cause. And they all claim the same two things, that they are beset daily by a veritable army of Republicans who are anonymous because they dare not speak out, and Democrats, who are entirely imaginary, and independents, who are actually Republicans, all begging them to create a center-right, center-left coalition to save America from the extremes on both sides, yada, yada, yada. When we talk about third parties, we want to be clear that if our federal government was organized differently, if it were a parliamentary system, the creation of multiple successful parties would not be an issue. In the same way that if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a bicycle. There are enough diverse issues facing our huge, complicated country to support dozens of political parties. But wishing that we had a parliamentary system that accommodates multi-party coalition governments does not make it so. We have what's called a first-past-the-post method. And according to what's known as Diverge's Law, constituencies that use first-past-the-post methods, that automatically leads to two-party systems given enough time. Economist Jeffrey Sachs explains, quote, The main reason for America's majoritarian character is the electoral system for Congress. Members of Congress are elected in single-member districts according to first-past-the-post principle meaning that the candidate with the plurality of votes is the winner of the congressional seat. The losing party or parties win no representation at all. The the first-past-the-post election tends to produce a small number of major parties, perhaps just two, a principle known in political science as Diverge's Law. Smaller parties are trampled in first-past-the-post elections, unquote. The predictable annual demand for a third party is especially weird and funny because those making the demand seem unaware that America has already seen dozens of, quote, third parties, unquote, come and go, they come and go, and that there is currently a wide assortment of third parties from which to choose. For example, there is the Libertarian Party, the Constitution Party, the Green Party, the Alliance Party, the Unity Party of America, the Working Class Party, the Working Families Party, the Socialist Equality Party, and the Socialist Party USA. And you know what, Blue Gal? Despite the fact that the goals of the Socialist Equality Party 
are diametrically opposed to the goals of the Libertarian Party, all third-party sales pitches come down to the same proposition, that there is not a dime's worth of difference between Democrats and Republicans. And because political form follows political function, the language any third-party sales pitch uses always sounds nearly identical to every other third-party sales pitch, no matter how wildly different each third party is from all the others. In every third-party pitch, both Democrats and Republicans are portrayed as irreversibly corrupt duopoly. Every third-party pitch claims that the majority of Americans agree with them, but that the will of that majority is constantly thwarted by this corrupt duopoly, that partisan extremists on both sides are conspiring to hold democracy hostage at the expense of the will of the imaginary majority the third party claims to represent. That the only way to break this partisan logjam is by creating yet another partisan political party. But this one will be awesome. So lend an ear to this exciting news, citizen, and listen to these excerpts from the sales pitch of the most successful third party in modern American history. <clears throat> Quote, I resent the fact that the leaders of both national parties wouldn't spit on the people who I've represented in the past. They've taken us for granted and used us for a doormat for so long, but now we're in control of the situation, and don't you ever believe we aren't in control. Unquote. And this, which followed a long story about how the common folk are too smart to fall for slick counterfeiters. Quote, when the National Republican Party and the National Democratic Party come out with their ambiguous platforms to try to pass it off on you and me in the fall, let's give them some sixes and nines in November, and they'll understand that we understand the difference between the real stuff and the counterfeit stuff. Do you want a party which recognizes that the real villain here is the system and not you wonderful voters? Well, this is the party for you. Quote, yes, the professional Republicans, and I'm not talking about the good Republicans or good Democrats or good independents, but the Republicans who come to your state and said, quote, let us beat the National Democrats, unquote. Well, if that's all you want to do, you can do that with anybody, unquote. Do you want a party which promises to rescue our public institutions from vile politicians on both sides? and return control of them to the people? Well, this is the party for you. Quote, so if you want to waste your vote in November, you can vote Republican or Democratic because they don't think like you do. They don't think like I do. Not a single one of these parties has told you that they will turn back to you, your domestic institutions, which includes the public school system. We're going to turn back lock, stock, and barrel to the people the right to run your schools as you see fit, unquote. Telling people that the reason they don't have everything they want is because sinister politicians are conspiring against them is as old as politics. And in modern American politics, no third party was more successful in positioning itself as the disruptors of the corrupt duopoly than the American Independent Party, the motto of the American Independent Party was and is no North, no South, no East, no West, one great nation, heaven blessed, which sounds an awful lot like the motto of today's forward party, not left, not right, forward, which also sounds an awful lot like the original motto of the no label scam, which was also not left, not right, forward. Here is the American Independent Party's declaration of principles, quote, a new party, is urgently needed today because the leaders of the two existing parties, Democratic and Republican, have deserted the principles and traditions of our nation's founding fathers. Both of the existing parties have become the proponents of big government, crushing taxation, dictatorial federal power, waste, and fiscal irresponsibility, unwholesome and disastrous internationalism, compromise with our nation's enemies, and authoritarian regimentation of the citizens of this republic. Control of the government under the domination of these two existing parties has left the hands of the people, 
our government was created to serve, which sure seems a lot like the mission statement of the country over party pack of former congressperson and current CNN employee Adam Kinzinger. Quote, mission, defeat toxic tribalism. America is not the fringe, yet the extremes are holding us hostage. Country First is dedicated to defeating the toxic tribalism, tearing our families, friendships, and country apart. Reasonable people of goodwill must band together to put country over party and save this nation for our kids and grandkids, unquote. This also applies to David Brooks's imaginary McCain-Lieberman party and Howard Schultz's flash-in-the-pan presidential campaign. And you may remember that just weeks before Kevin McCarthy's complete capitulation to the worst lunatics in his party, which took place as Democrats voted unanimously and enthusiastically for Hakeem Jeffries, Margaret White, the executive director of No Labels, was still insisting that the Problem Solver Caucus would save us all from the extremes on both sides. This is the headline from The Hill, December 16th, 2022. Problem solvers can, at long last, be kingmakers. Let me just interject aloud. Ha. Ha and right fucking there. ha. Yeah. <laughs> but none of these third-party, third-way schemes has amounted to much more than pale imitations of the original and by far most successful third-party run, the American Independent Party, which was founded in 1967 by Bill Shearer and his wife, Eileen Nolan Shearer, for the purpose of nominating hardcore racist and segregationist George Wallace as its presidential candidate and retired U.S. Air Force General Curtis LeMay as the vice presidential candidate. Curtis LeMay was a real nuke em all let God sort em out madman. And you may know him best from his caricature, Colonel Jack D. Ripper, played by Sterling Hayden in Dr. Strangelove. But the real story here is how George Wallace, a circuit judge of the Third Judicial Circuit in Alabama, who was endorsed in his first run for governor by the NAACP, rose to come within hair's breadth of being a presidential kingmaker, how his success reshaped the Republican Party and how he used the Confederate Civil War vocabulary of grievance and defiance to rise to power, vocabulary that has been recycled by other Republicans ever since. And the life of George Wallace turned on two major hinges, his defeat in 1958 in his first race for governor, and the day in 1972 he was shot and nearly killed by a man named Arthur Bremer. Now, in 1952, Wallace became the circuit judge of the Third Judicial Circuit in Alabama. Here he became known as the Fighting Little Judge, and he built a reputation for fairness regardless of the race of the plaintiff. Black Alabama lawyer J.L. Chestnut later said that, quote, Judge George Wallace was the most liberal judge that I had ever practiced in front of. He was the first judge in Alabama to call me Mr. in a courtroom. Then Wallace decided to run for governor. And since Alabama's post-Reconstruction Constitution effectively disenfranchised the state's black citizens, and most poor whites as well, the Democratic Party had a virtual one-party rule in the state. Whoever won the Democratic primary had, for all intents and purposes, won the office. Although 14 people were running in the Democratic primary, Wallace's main opponent was State Attorney General John Malcolm Patterson, who ran with the public support of the Ku Klux Klan. Wallace had spoken out against the Klan and had been endorsed by the NAACP, and he ran as a moderate. Now, just take a minute to let that sink in. George Wallace ran as the NAACP candidate and as a moderate in his first run for governor. And this was in 1958, 5'8". 1958, during the lifetime of some people who were listening to this podcast. That's right. And Wallace got creamed. He lost the nomination by nearly 35,000 votes. After that election, Wallace told his aide, Seymour Trammell, quote, Seymour, you know why I lost the governor's race? I was out N-worded by John Patterson. And I'll tell you here and now, I will never be out N-worded again. The electoral math in Alabama was that simple. 
and as a ruthless and ambitious politician, Wallace only had to lose once to understand what it would take to get to the governor's mansion. In the wake of his defeat, almost overnight, Wallace transformed himself into one of the state's loudest and most hardline segregationists. When a supporter asked why he started using racist messages, Wallace replied, you know, I tried to talk about good roads and good schools and all those things that have been a part of my career, and nobody listened. And then I began talking about N-words, and they stomped the floor. He began his public transformation by being the only judge in Alabama to refuse to comply with a subpoena in a federal investigation into voter suppression. Behind the scenes, Wallace tried to bargain with a friendly federal judge to put him in jail for just one day so he could make himself out a martyr to the cause of segregation. The judges refused, and Wallace ended up giving the federal government the voter information they had demanded, but then turned around and told the public that he had never given up and had defied the feds and won a mighty victory here in the heart of the Confederacy. It was all a lie, but the public bought it. Then he made a campaign out of demonizing the judge that had refused to put him in jail. To complete his transformation, Wallace hired an infamous Klan spokesman named Asa Earl Carter to help write his speeches. A couple things to know about Carter. He he broke with the leadership of the Alabama Citizens Council because it wasn't anti-Semitic enough. Yeah, not hateful enough for Carter. Carter had refused to tone down his anti-Semitic rhetoric. While the Citizens Council preferred to focus more narrowly on preserving racial segregation against African Americans. You, you can't do both, little gal. <laughs> it's too hard to do both. It's just it, it's too much on your plate, you know? Also, the regular Klan wasn't racist and vicious enough for Carter either. So he founded a more violent, fanatical splinter group called Original Ku Klux Klan of the Confederacy, end quote. Man. George Wallace easily won the 1962 Democratic primary for governor and ran unopposed in the general election, where he took 96% of the vote. When Wallace took the oath of office in January of 1963, he stood on the gold star marking the spot where, nearly 102 years earlier, Jefferson Davis was sworn in as the provisional president of the Confederate States of America. In his inaugural speech, Wallace said, In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny. And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. This sentence had been written by the Wallace speechwriter Asa Earl Carter. Now, you told me you had visited that spot. You, you... Uh, the White House of the Confederacy is a museum in Alabama. I lived yeah. in Alabama for 14 years. All three of my children were born in greater Birmingham, Alabama. So I have a lot of experience with the kind of uh, history. I mean, at this point, it was history when I lived there. But uh, the honoring of Confederate soldiers and the honoring of the heritage, as they call it, of uh, the Confederacy in Alabama. Uh, it was it was very much a part of the Alabama experience in the late 90s, 2000s when I lived there. And uh, yeah, it was a thing to go to the White House of the Confederacy, which is a museum. Yeah. Um, now, and now now I will say own- in, in defense of Alabama, uh, in my opinion, the very best civil rights museum in the entire country is in Birmingham. It's phenomenal. And if you are ever in that part of the country, don't visit the White House of the Confederacy. (laughs) (laughs) No. Although you can. It's a very small wooden structure. And, you know, it's one of the things you notice about visiting antebellum homes in Alabama is the poverty. Um, You know, how small, uh, how poor things were in spite of the grandeur of their rhetoric you know, these were poor people. But uh, the Civil Rights Museum 
which is right across the street from the Baptist church where the four little girls died due to a firebomb, uh, you know, set by a Confederate insurrectionist. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the four little girls died right there. And yeah. uh, when you go through the Civil Rights Museum, the last thing you will see is this very large window looking out over that church. It's uh, emotionally exhausting, very rewarding, and I highly recommend that if you're in that area, you go make a special trip to go to that Civil Rights Museum. Well, but and, uh, but that bombing happened during this whole era that we're talking yeah, exactly, about, the exactly. Wallace years. Th- these were the Wallace years. And, and yeah. you know, if you're ever visiting Springfield, first you stop in and we, we have some coffee and we talk, you know, this, this is what you <laughs> do. But uh, the guy who destroyed the Confederacy is buried a mile from our house. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the Lincoln tomb. Everything in this town is Lincoln. But everything it, in this town is Lincoln. Yeah. And, and there's no history is right there. Mm-hmm. This is not ancient history. This is this happened during the lives of people, you know, people you grew yeah. up with. This is and, and Wallace was a product of these times. And yeah. Wallace, as a person who was saturated in this and who wanted who terribly politically ambitious, knew exactly what sort of dark places to take the public. And he appealed to the basest instinct of American racists and spread rage and violence. This was his key to power. And he understood it perfectly. And he played it like a $2 fiddle. And if all this sounds familiar, from trying on various political masks until you find one that fits, to defying subpoenas, to make themselves out a martyr, to attacking judges, to blatantly Mm -hmm. lying to his followers and his followers believing it, to open appeals to racism, to attacking the liberal press and whipping white mobs into frenzies of rage and paranoia, it should sound familiar. Elements of this strategy have been used by Republicans ever since Nixon and his henchmen saw how successful the Wallace presidential campaign had been in 1968. And they began adapting it into their infamous Southern strategy. Kevin Phillips, who was one of the architects of the strategy, called it organizing discontent. And all of it, the whole Wallace playbook, was the Donald Trump playbook in 2016. And like Trump, when Wallace got elected, he got bored. He wasn't interested in governing. He was in it for the title and the rallies and the crowds and the adulation and the stunts and the headlines and the power and the money, not the policies or the boring process of politics. Yeah, and and I'm going to interrupt you for one moment just to say uh, George Wallace was inaugurated governor in early 1963, by eight, by June of 1963, he was doing things like the stand in the schoolhouse door. Yeah, these are all. It was one all... stunt after another to and, defend white supremacy and they for were, the television and, cameras. For the television cameras, exactly. All this was staged for the television cameras, mm-hmm. and boy, he loved his rallies too, didn't he? I mean, mm-hmm. this, this really was a government by stunt, and just mm-hmm. keep the crowds enraged. You know, he yeah. was thrilled when they the, then they sent the National Guard down there because then he could yep. look like the the last defender of the of the noble Confederacy. Right. right. And like Trump, the national media helped him out by not taking him seriously, by treating him like a clown, which only made him more popular with his voters. And by touring the country and speaking to crowds outside the South, Wallace discovered that the resentment and working class anger were not confined to the South. So being a politician, he refined his message, began making a little more coded, a little more palatable to audiences in other time zones. Eggheads and long hairs and lazy pinkos and communists. And of course, the evil federal government joined the list of enemies who were oppressing real Americans by giving away their country and their money to minorities. So in 1964, Wallace tested his growing national profile by running against Lyndon Johnson in Democratic presidential primaries in Maryland, Wisconsin, and Indiana. And he had no money, almost no money, or campaign infrastructure in any of those states. But nonetheless, he took over a third of the vote. By being the face and voice of opposition to civil rights, by 1965, Wallace had built for himself a national constituency. But in 1966, he was about to lose his own seat of power, the governorship of Alabama, due to term limits. Yep. The Alabama Constitution at that time prohibited the governor from serving two consecutive terms. Wallace solved this problem by running his wife, Lurleen, 
for governor in 1966. Lurleen was a housewife. She didn't want to be a politician. She was painfully shy. She was recovering from cancer surgery. She was not an experienced public speaker, and she really had no interest in politics. But she practiced and worked hard at getting better at it because that's what her husband wanted her to do. Lurleen had two campaign slogans. I'm gonna let George do it. And Lurleen for governor in 66, George for president in 68. Lurleen actually served as governor, though. She had the governor's office and she signed the bills. But George was right across the hall and the gubernatorial staff was all George's. Lurleen did two things as governor that were distinctly her own. Having toured a draconian state mental hospital in Tuscaloosa that was an absolute dungeon, a distraught Lurleen sponsored a bond measure for mental health and state parks that actually passed. The Lurleen Wallace State Mental Health Center lasted for decades. Thanks to the Voting Rights Act, 1966 was also the first election in Alabama where a significant number of blacks had been able to register to vote, a fact which was reflected in George Wallace's campaign rhetoric. Suddenly, race was not front and center all the time. Instead, Wallace stumped for fighting the communist in Vietnam, unquote, and in the next sentence railed against the communist-controlled beatnik mobs in the streets who influenced national affairs in Washington, D.C. Damn those beatnik mobs and their communist roots. (laughs) Antifa. Oh, wait. No, that's a different thing. (laughs) Bingo. But not really. Yes. His primary opponent, who was trying to court black votes, pointed out that Wallace had pivoted from race baiting to now calling everyone who disagreed with him a communist. Because, quote, there are not 238,000 communists registered to vote in Alabama, but there are 238,000 black people. Uh, That didn't matter. Alabama bigots loved Wallace, and they gave his wife a landslide. With a hammerlock on the state government, Wallace purged anyone who wasn't 100% a loyalist and turned the governor's office into a machine for extorting bribes and kickbacks from anyone doing business with the state. That money became his war chest for running for president two years later, in 1968, leading the ticket of the newly formed American Independent Party. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Was his war chest called Win Red at the time, or was it something different? (laughs) Okay. It wasn't the Make America Great Again pack, either. In 1968, with the assassination of Martin Luther King and the riots that followed, Wallace would see his chance to ride that chaos to national power. And this was when Lurleen Wallace did the second thing to make her mark on U.S. history. In May of 1968, Lurleen Wallace, governor of Alabama, died of cancer. Her cancer had returned aggressive and untreatable. Her husband had lied about her condition repeatedly, and she died. Now, Alabama, like all states, does not allow the husband of the governor to just take over the governor's office. Uh, Spouses are not allowed to succeed their governor. Lurleen Wallace was succeeded by Albert Brewer, a New South Democrat. Yeah, those New South Democrats were about to become a big thing. Yeah, like Um, Jimmy Carter next door. Yeah, Damn right. Jimmy Carter was a New South Democrat, and he, he was watching and learning from all of this. Yeah. Um, so after mourning his wife's death, George Wallace was comforted by his real mistress, the political campaign. As a practical matter, Wallace knew he would never be able to win the White House outright. Instead, his plan was to play spoiler by winning enough electoral votes to deny the presidency to either major party and then play kingmaker by brokering a deal with whichever party made him the best offer. And he came damn close to succeeding. Out of the 73 million votes cast in 1968, nearly 10 million of them were for Wallace. He won five states, all in the Deep South, and picked up 46 electoral votes out of the 270 needed to win. If just 1% of the vote had shifted in just two or three states, Wallace's strategy would have worked. Now, 20 years before George Wallace of Alabama split from the Democratic Party to run for president, As the head of a segregationist third party, Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina has split from the Democratic Party 
to run for president in 1948 at the head of a segregationist third party called the State's Rights Democratic Party, which had been formed by Southern white bigots who were Democrats who split from the National Party over the threat of federal intervention in state affairs regarding segregation and Jim Crow. I think it's important to interject here Mm -hmm. that the Dixiecrats uh, in the Democratic Party switched parties in 1964 and became Republican. Oh, yeah. This is a continuum. You have Mm -hmm. to understand. I I wrote a long, long thing, uh, I think, called In the Beginning. It's a post called Mm -hmm. In the Beginning. Mm -hmm. And it starts, in my mind, with Strom Thurmond walking out of the Democratic Convention and starting his own party. Um, Mm -hmm. Because these were all hardcore, deeply committed Southern segregationists. And they were solidly behind Roosevelt. And this is how Roosevelt got his supermajorities. But once the Democratic Party started embracing civil rights, in Truman's case, I believe it was desegregating the army. Right. Uh, And Johnson with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. uh, Johnson himself said, we've lost the South for a generation once he signed the Civil Rights Act. And he was wrong. It was two generations. Maybe it's three generations. Yeah. But all of these people kept trying to become something other than a Democratic Party member. And they succeeded. And they became the new Republican Party under Mm -hmm. Nixon and Reagan and on and on and on. Now, this is this is something Dinesh D'Souza always skips over that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the Democrats are the party of the Klan. And that's the end of the discussion. Right. Right. Okay, let's talk about Julius Caesar. I mean, let's talk about if you want to talk about history that has no bearing on reality right now. That's a great bumper sticker. But you you bring anyone into a conversation about anything to do with this states rights and, and why the South seceded and what, what was going through their minds and what were their demands and how did the country react politically to this event and what happened 100 years later? They don't want to have that conversation. Right. I, right. I've said a thousand times. Every Republican is a civil rights historian right up until 1964. Mm-hmm. And then they suddenly forget everything that's happened. And everything after that is yada, 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 Reagan. And then Obama destroyed everything. <laughs> and they really, and these are, the problem is these are the times through which most Republicans, you know, live through. Right. They're the ones who chose to be part of a racist party that had a racist platform and elected racists to represent them. Um, explicitly. And they don't want to talk about that. They want Mm -hmm. to talk about the bad old days before you and I were born. And they want to talk about the glorious future. So during the bad old days, Thurman's supporters were in control of the Democratic Party in the Deep South. And in 1948, President Truman was not included on the presidential ballot in Alabama because that state's Supreme Court ruled that party electors were no longer required to vote for the national nominee. Thurman ran against the extremes on all three sides. The incumbent Democratic president, Harry Truman, Republican Thomas Dewey, and progressive party candidate, Henry Wallace. So I guess technically Thurman ran as a fourth party candidate. Thurman warned that every other party would lead the U.S. to totalitarianism and insisted that all civil rights initiatives were dangerous to the American Constitution and would make the country susceptible to Communism. Strom Thurmond carried four states and got 39 electoral votes, but was not able to stop Truman's reelection. And George Wallace's American Independent Party was built on the bones of Strom Thurmond's states' rights Democratic Party. And 20 years later, in 1968, Wallace ran for office on virtually the same platform, Law and Order versus Chaos. A 1968 Wallace political ad showed buildings on fire. And here's a quote from that ad. Look at America. Take a good look. This was done by anarchists, revolutionaries, the Molotov cocktail set. Ask yourself, why are the anti-American, anti-God anarchists also violently anti-Wallace? Want to get rid of them? Then don't waste your vote on those that encourage the sit-ins and illegal marches. Vote for a law-abiding, God-fearing America. It takes courage. Wallace has it. Do you? Those darn Black Lives Matters protesters. You, right. You know, yeah. And the both-siderism as well. This also from a 1968 Wallace campaign speech. Quote, It is a sad day in our country that you cannot walk 
even in your neighborhoods at night or even in the daytime because both national parties in the last number of years have kowtowed to every group of anarchists that have roamed the streets of San Francisco and Los Angeles and throughout the country. And now they have created themselves a Frankenstein monster and the chickens are coming home to roost all over this country, unquote. Those long-haired liberal types claim to love free speech, but they mean free speech for themselves and nobody else, said Wallace. Unless you've been living under a rock for the past 50 years, you can clearly hear Republicans, either directly or by proxy, echoing Wallace's grievance-mongering, race-baiting, attacking the liberal media and liberal judges, and caricaturing everyone to the left of Genghis Khan as lazy, godless, communist elites. From that day until this, every Republican, from Agnew to Trump, from Limbaugh to Carlson, and from Tom DeLay to Marjorie Taylor Greene, has known which buttons to push to scare the rubes out of their votes and money, just as every third-party scheme has known that to scare the fence straddlers and cowards out of their votes and money You need to bang on that because both national parties have betrayed you, drum, as loud as possible. They all claim to speak for the average American, the normal American, the silent majority, the moral majority, the decent, hardworking, God-fearing, sensible, centrist Americans. What they really mean is white nationalism. And in 1968... Pundits and professional political havers of opinions watched as Wallace's poll numbers kept going up and up from 8 to 10 to 22 percent of voters saying they supported George Wallace. And then came this amazing press conference. This was the press conference where Wallace introduced his running mate, Curtis, nuke him till they glow and shoot him in the dark, LeMay. This was supposed to get Wallace the veterans vote. That was the plan. But despite the fact that Wallace's people had coached LeMay all night to avoid the subject, when asked, Curtis LeMay just couldn't stop himself from holding forth at length about the glories of the hydrogen bomb. After that news hit the national press, Wallace's numbers began to drop. But even after failing to win a spoiler seat at the table, his national profile and popularity with a large white minority remained high. But to keep his future presidential ambitions alive, he would have to regain his seat as governor, and this time, he'd have to beat a popular incumbent, Albert Brewer, who, thanks to changes George and Lurleen had fought to make in the Alabama Constitution, would now be entitled to run for a second term. Well, go figure. (laughs) Yeah, golly. Um, For help, Brewer secretly turned to a man named Richard Milhouse Nixon. Now, Nixon wanted Wallace the hell out of national politics and understood that Brewer beating Wallace in Alabama meant eliminating Wallace as a future political threat. And for a time, the Brewer people dreamed that maybe the way Wallace had been coding his language for national campaign meant that his viciousness and racism had, you know, mellowed somewhat. And boy, were they wrong. The Wallace campaign let Brewer have it with both barrels. They spread rumors that Brewer was gay that his wife was an alcoholic, that one of his daughters was pregnant out of wedlock by a black man. Campaign literature had doctored photos of Brewer palling around with Nation of Islam leader Elijah Muhammad, you know, like <laughs> like Alabama governors always do. Black voters were sudden. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, it this just, is Reverend Wright all over again. It, 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 this is what just drives me crazy. It Nothing ever really changes. The strategies are always the same. The black voters of Alabama were suddenly the militant black voters of Alabama. Mm -hmm. And the day of the election, Wallace campaign workers fanned out to polling places to walk up and down the lines repeating, remember you're white, over and over and over again. Wallace forced the primary election to a runoff and then won the runoff and then went on to win the general election in a landslide. Then with his power base locked down and free once again to focus on running for president, Wallace told the national press that he had been misunderstood. Oh, no. That he always had been a moderate, and he no longer believed in segregation. By this time, Nixon's IRS was climbing all over Wallace's top people, including Wallace's brother, 
who took kickbacks from everybody. No one can ever prove it, but after Nixon visited Alabama and had some back-channel conversations, which were open between Nixon's people and Wallace's people, George Wallace suddenly decided not to run as an independent in 1972, but as a Democrat. And a few days later, Nixon's Internal Revenue Service suddenly decided to drop their investigations into the finances of the Wallace campaign. What a crazy coincidence. That's so wild that these things happen in politics all the time. Wallace began his 1972 run for president as a Democrat with the Florida Democratic primary, and his campaign seized on the critical race theory of the day, forced busing. It was a perfect issue for Wallace to demagogue. Liberal judges and liberal elites forcing decent, hardworking, God-fearing white parents to sacrifice their children to the communist left's ideas of social engineering. It was segregation now, tomorrow, and forever without having to say segregation. It was without the Klan robes. He could just say he was against busing children rather than I'm for segregating schools. Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis. Wallace even put Nixon on the spot, predicting that if Wallace won Florida, Nixon would step in and stop forced busing. Wallace won Florida in a landslide. He won every county in that primary. And just as Wallace had predicted, less than two days later, Nixon announced to the country that he would be asking Congress to pass legislation that would end all new federal busing legislation. Wallace also won Alabama on the same day and ran a close second in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Wallace won in Tennessee. He won in North Carolina. He was running a close second to George McGovern and ahead of Humphrey, Muskie, and the rest of the field. But on the 15th of May in 1972, a man named Arthur Bremer, who had been keeping track of Wallace across the country and had attended Wallace rallies, surged out of the crowd during a stop on his Democratic presidential campaign at the Laurel Shopping Center. Arthur Bremer shot George Wallace five times. Now, Wallace survived the assassination attempt, but the momentum of his campaign carried him on to win both Maryland and Michigan. However, his national political career was effectively over, and he would spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. The Democratic Party extended an invitation to Wallace to speak at their 1972 Florida convention. They hoped by bringing him on board, they could woo his supporters. And Wallace saw it as a chance to put himself back into national politics, but he bombed very badly and then all but disappeared from public view. For what it's worth, being in a wheelchair seems to have brought a little humility to George Wallace. He spent the rest of his life as a proclaimed born-again Christian and publicly asked forgiveness from black Americans. He ran for governor again and won a fifth term in 1982. And Wikipedia notes that, quote, during Wallace's final term as governor, 1983 through 1987, he appointed a record number of black Americans to state positions, including, for the first time, two as a member of the same cabinet. Many black Alabamians mourned him when he died in 1998. And I lived in Alabama on the day George Wallace died, and it was amazing. The, those of us white liberals walking around uh, talking about it to each other couldn't believe the number of black people who were willing to step up to a microphone and call George Wallace a good Christian man. Yeah. Well, it was remarkable. Church, church, you know, a very forgiving and open hearted church yep. Yep. teaches you to be a better Christian than I will ever be. Right, exactly. Uh, because exactly. His, because Wallace's real legacy is ruthless opportunism. Yep. And using the politics for resentment and rage and white grievance to seize and hold power. So the next time another third party or third way movement or country over party political action committee comes for your money and your vote by proclaiming there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats, you can thank George Corley Wallace for putting those words in their mouths. And the next time some Republican comes for your money or your vote, telling you that the immigrants or communists or those people are out to get what's rightfully yours, real America, you can thank George Corley Wallace for putting those words in their mouths, too. It is really amazing to me 
how little George Wallace believed in anything, which oh, is yeah. very similar to Trump. Uh, well, it's it's if you go down the list, he's Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, he's most of the Republican leadership, the people mm-hmm. who just, you know, he's Tucker Carlson. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if if he if Tucker Carlson could become a brutal American, you know, dictator's spokesperson by proposing free medical care and and voting for Joe Biden, he'd do it. He doesn't believe yeah. in anything. He mm-hmm. believes in power mm-hmm. and money. Yeah. And Wallace only believed in power. He didn't really much care about money. Except the money that he could he could get in kickbacks. Oh, sure. So sure. he could run again. Yeah. Yeah. And he was a very good spokesman. He loved rallies, especially when protesters came. <laughs> just like Trump. So he could point at him and say, oh, that boy needs a haircut. You let me take him out for the haircut and I can cure him right tomorrow. And talk about, you know, the these people who were uh, laid down in front of um, uh, the motorcade of the president of the United States to stop him when they were protesting. They lay down in front of my limousine. I'll tell you what, the, they're never going to get up again. He loved mocking people at his rallies. He loved pointing to the liberal press and saying, there's the enemy right over there. And it it is remarkable how exactly Donald Trump imitated every single tick that George Wallace did and that mm-hmm. every other Republican and frankly, third party people reuse that same vocabulary over and over again for the same reasons. Yeah. And uh, this is and why it's really important to remember stuff. It really you is. You see those kind of demagogues start to rise to power. If you remember what happened in the past, you can, you can make sense of it. At least you might not be able to stop it, but you can make sense of it. Thanks for listening. Don't forget, we're looking for about 30 more Patreons to make this podcast fly. So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. See you next time. See you next time. The Professional F Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.